Okay, good afternoon, coaches. My name is Kyle McElvaney. I'm an assistant football coach at St. Mary's Catholic Central in Monroe, Michigan. Today, I'll be talking about the play action passing from the Power T offense. Uh, just before I continue, I want to thank Coach Nick Banstra for having me on his channel today. It's been really cool to see his YouTube channel grow over these last few months. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you bookmark and subscribe to his channel. He has over 150, 200 coaching clinics from college and high school coaches all around the country. And it's probably one of the best, if not the best, free resource out there as far as virtual coaches clinics. Just real briefly, I'm gonna talk about my coaching philosophy. The older I get, the more I think it's important to talk about this. And it comes down to faith, family, and football. Um, I believe this, that building trust is an intentional effort. You don't, the days of just gaining trust from kids because of your title are over. I think you really have to make an effort through at it, you know, really just by your day-to-day -day actions. Um, you know, walking the talk, if you believe in this or that, then you got to live it. And kids are also going to see how you indirectly act towards them. You know, how do you treat the custodians in your building? How do you treat those third string scout team kids on your, in your program? Kids are going to recognize and see how genuine you really are. Um, you know, I'm a dad now of a, he's almost of a, a, a three-year-old boy. He'll be four in August. Um, and I believe this is that you should coach kids the way you would want your own kid to be treated. And also, are you going to be the guy that brings up the energy in the room or down the energy in the room? Are you a negative kind of guy or a positive kind of guy? And I know we don't live in a world that's all sunshine and rainbows and football is a tough business, but I think whether it's football, any sport, whether you work in education an office setting or whatnot, I think there's always going to be people that are going to bring up the room or just suck the energy out of the room. And I want to be a guy that brings up the energy in the room. I want to, I, I'm not a kind of guy, I don't respond well to people that are always negative. You know, the world's always raining on them. I'm a kind of guy that I just, believe, you know, I think you can get more out of people with positivity. And it's kind of cool, this slide is, is these are pictures from, in the bottom left corner, from, when I was an assistant at Swan High School in Northwest Ohio. And my last year there was 2010. And in a couple of weeks, we're actually gonna have a 10 year reunion of that team. We weren't very good. I think we finished the season one and nine. I ended up having to be the interim head coach that year because our head coach had to leave early. They brought in someone and it didn't work out. and. Uh, I couldn't have been more than 22 or 23 years old at the time. Like I said, we weren't that successful win and loss wise, but those kids, they worked so hard. And we, as a staff and myself, we worked so hard at building those relationships and being there for them. And now for those kids, you know, we're having a 10 year reunion of that team in a couple of weeks. And that's just something really special and reminds you of why you coach. Uh, in the middle, there's a, a picture of my son. He's about two in that picture, you know, before a home game when I was the head coach at Dundee High School. And then to the far right there is when I was an assistant at Anthony Wayne High School. That picture looks to be from uh, 2013. And just every step along the way, I learned something. And I think it's important, you know, if you're an assistant coach watching this, to make sure that before you rush into being a head coach and take the first head coaching job you can get, that you work for someone, uh, you work for a head coach that's been successful, knows the game, knows how to build programs. So you, you have those mentors that you can really learn from. You can only learn so much from a clinic, from a book or a DVD video, whatnot. But to really live it and be a part of a successful program, I think is invaluable. 
I'm not going to read through this word for word. You guys are welcome to pause and read through this if you want, if you care. Um, but I was really lucky to work for some good coaches throughout my career as an assistant, spending uh, 10 years in Ohio. You know, at Delta High School, I worked under Mike Vickers, who will, he'll be in the Hall of Fame one day. Uh, he turned around six different programs over the course of his 30 years as a head coach. For Ben Olemaker at Swan High School, Craig Smith at Anthony Wayne High School, he was the head coach there for 18 years. Um, and then I, I was the head coach at Dundee High School in Michigan for five years. I resigned in February of 2020. Uh, for numerous reasons, and now I'm the special teams coordinator. I work with the linemen, and I'll also be our victory day or one team day director as well as of March 1st of this year. So that's a typo. There should be March 1st of 2020. I'm also the director of the St. Andre Bissett Open Doors Inclusion Program, which is the first full special education program for a Catholic high school in the state of Michigan. And uh, we're very proud of that. If, if you're a Catholic educator or work in a private school and want to learn more about how we do that, feel free to check out the website link below there. Moving on, uh, there's our clinic agenda, what we're going to cover today. Uh, just briefly talk about our school. We're the smallest school in our league. St. Mary Catholic Central is the product of a merger that took place in 1986 between Monroe Catholic Central, which was an all-boys school, and St. Mary's Academy, which was an all-girls school. We're located just about a half hour south of Detroit, um, 15 to 20 minutes north of Toledo in the state line, depending on traffic. We play in the Huron League, uh, which is Division Three through Division Five schools. So we're the smallest school in our league by far. Um, and we're okay with that. It helps us with playoff preparation for playoffs. And, you know, it, we've been a member of the Huron League for as long as I can remember. And it gives, it's very good competition. There's some very well coached, very good, well coached programs in our league. Um, we're a very tradition rich program. We're the number 17th overall in the state of Michigan in all time winning percentage. In the past decade alone, we've been fortunate enough to win two state titles. Uh, one under my mentor and good friend, father figure, Jack Jarmo, who was the head coach from 1998 to 2014. And then Adam Kipp, who, was the, who is the head coach now currently since 2000, the 2015 season. Um, and he also, they also won a state title this past season in Division VI in Michigan. Um, this year, we'll carry approximately 30 guys on varsity. We're looking at about 25 kids, seniors and juniors, with another four or five sophomores. And then we'll also carry another 25 to 30 kids on JV. Um, these are approximately the same numbers we had at Dundee High School, which is Dundee is my previous coaching stop where I was the head coach. And I'll be re referring to them a lot today because. The offense we ran at Dundee is what I'll be covering, although it is similar to SMCC. I'm not going to be going through SMC's offense with you today, um, even though they're similar offenses. And like I said, we're the first Catholic high school in the state of Michigan to have a fully inclusive special education program. Um, this is the philosophy and the power T. I'm not going to read through this verbatim. All I'll say is this is you got to be committed to it if you want to be successful. Uh, less is more. And it's the Kool-Aid analogy. Gus Kalpalka, who's the head coach at Cedar Springs High School in Michigan, always says this. The more you add, down, the more you add to the T offense, the more watered down it gets. Just like the more water you add to Kool-Aid, the more watered down it gets. And you got to know that you can't be all things to all people. People are going to complain. They're going to wonder why you don't have receivers, why you don't run the read option or this or that. Just stick to what you believe in, trust the system, and, and success will come in time. Um, this is a list of records set by the power T. As you see there, the, the most points scored in a, a single season. And this 
record still stands, even though I haven't updated this slide in a couple years, is 774 points in one season by Muskegon Orchard View. Um, the head coach at the time was John Shilato, who is now the head coach at Zeeland West High School, and they averaged 55.3 points per game. And as you can see there, there's many other teams. Um, Zeeland West is on there quite a bit. Traverse City, St. Francis, Beale City, East Kentwood, uh, Constantine, who's coached by Sh Sean Griffith now, and he does a great job there. Climax Scotts, who is now an eight-man football team, but at the time when they set this record, they were Division Eight, I believe, and they're coached by Kevin Langs, and they've done a great job as well. Just briefly, a little bit about the T formation. We have six inch splits between the centers, guards, and tackles. And then between our tackles and tight ends, we're anywhere from one, at one foot to one and a half to two and a half, depending on the defense and their alignment and the ability of the tight ends. Um, our fullback sets, sets the depth for our backfield with his toes at four yards from the back tip of the football. And then the halfbacks are arm's length away, touching fingertips with the fullback. And we number our backs. Uh, the quarterback is always one, the fullback is three, and then both halfbacks are fours. And we wanna be off the ball as far as we legally can be. So our guards will set the depth of the line by putting their helmet even with the center's hip. Another way we teach that is, is by having their down hand and a three-point stance on the center's toes. Um, this is just the run game we'll utilize. And this is again from my time at Dundee. Um, and it'll be similar in the future at SMCC, give or take a play or two, but just so you have an idea of what we're complementing in the play action. So why are we talking about passing and the power T? It's kind of an oxymoron. I truly believe this, that it can be the difference in November in the playoffs when you're against teams that are good or is better with athlete-wise. I think it can be the difference maker when you're playing a team that may, have, may play in a league or with their schedule play a T team four or five or six times you have to have something else for them. Um, it takes advantage of that, of, of that talented quarterback. Um, it gives you answers too when you're down more than a score with minutes left. It's that necessary evil. Um, and for us, when we were at Dundee, it was to help make our run game better. We did not, at Dundee, our guards averaged anywhere from 160 to 170 pounds. Our tackles were, if we were lucky, were over 210 pounds. And our tight ends were just like guards. I mean, they're, if we were there over 200 pounds, we were lucky. We did not have a bunch of big, strong guys, but we were fast and we played with a low pad level. And by passing it, it kind of opened up our run game. Um, just some passing stats from the last five years. Um, you know, and there was times where we got into different formations, like a pro set, or we split out an end, or we had a twins formation or trips formation, but um, we tended to throw it more on years when our quarterback was not as good of a runner, but more of a, a, a manager, a game manager for us. In 2018, we introduced our Tiger package, which was a double tight empty shotgun formation that we shifted to actually from the T, which I'll get into later in this presentation. Um, if we did have an athletic quarterback, we loved running boot in our sprint out passing game. A lot of the sprint out passing game that we adopted at Dundee actually came from the Bill Walsh's doctoral thesis at Stanford. You can find that if you Google search it. Um, through interlibrary loan, or you might be lucky and find a PDF version of it. It's a pretty thick doctoral thesis, but it's, it's worth reading if you're a fan and you're a real student of the game. Uh, Andrew Coverdale and Dan Robinson, their books and DVD series, 
their PowerPoints that are out there and the 40, the San Francisco 49ers film clinics are good as well. Um, looking back on the years, I wish I would have probably been more patient and lived more three and a half feet football, or I mean three and a half yard football and been a little more patient with my play calling, but just know if you're in this offense, trap on third and long is not a, black, a bad play call. You'll be surprised what you can get if you run trap well. And, you know, I heard this when I was a younger coach from an old time coach. He's now retired now, but he was the head football coach at Liberty Center High School in Northwest Ohio. His name is Rex Lingren. And his philosophy on passing in the double tight wing T was this. If you're going to throw it, you better throw it for a first down or a touchdown, or you better run it. And uh, that's kind of the philosophy we adapted over the years. We tried to be very efficient. Um, our quarterback at Dundee, my last quarterback I had, he broke the completion percentage record for the school. And that's what we strive to be, is efficient with our passing. And as you see there, starting in 2015, which was my first year as a head coach and going on through the years, we got a little bit better at passing every year. Um, you know, in 2018, we broke the school record for passing completion percentage with 65.6% completion. Um, our passing touchdowns went up every year. I mean, from three to six to eight to 10 to actually 13 my final year with two different kids. Um, my last three years there, we threw for 906 yards, then 944 yards, and actually a combined total 1,021 yards. And obviously, if you want more film than what I'm going to show you today, because I'm only going to show a few clips, uh, just let me know, and I'll find a way to get those to you. How we install passing. So we install passing in the summer through our seven-on-sevens. We use a binder. We draw them up in PowerPoint or Google Slides, color code them, and actually teach the routes then and there. We do seven on sevens with schools and coaches that we have a good relationship with and know we can teach instead of trying to win a, a worthless seven on seven. And we also use this drill in the preseason. Uh, we always did a camp the first full week after school let out for, it'd be a three day camp. It'd be offense and defense and a little bit of special teams, but more so offense probably got, I don't know, I would say, 50% of it, the camp, and it was called trap and throw. So on one side of the, we would say I was standing on the 50 yard line. On the one side of the 50, on the 35, we would have a group with a center, a quarterback, two tight ends in our backfield working through our play action passing concepts. On the other side, on the 35, we'd have a center, a quarterback, a fullback, and our offensive line installing trap, our, thir our inside trap, 31-32 trap against even odd and TNT or double eagle fronts, whatever you want to call them. Um, we did this for 20 minutes a day, and we would rotate the quarterbacks and fullbacks every five minutes. And the big thing was is we tried to involve as many kids as possible. We made, I would make sure as the head coach that I scripted head co uh, our assistants to rotate kids at certain times. Um, but I, not, if you're going to run this drill, make sure you have someone on staff that knows your passing game as good as you do and knows your coaching points because you're not going to be able to be in both places at once. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just if you want to pause it and check it out. We try at Dundee and Anthony Wayne, and I, I'll try to do this at SMCC, is we try to put everything we can on a stopwatch, have an ideal time for everything. Um, and also, you need to know if you're going to run the T, you need to decide how much three-step or sprint out is really necessary for you. You're just starting out running this offense. I would not suggest putting in any three-step game. I would run our play at, get really good at three, 
maybe only two play actions and maybe one or two sprint out passing game using motion, and that's it. I'm telling you, to really perfect this offense, you have to be okay coaching with enthusiasm, rep after rep after rep with not a lot of plays. Um, just real quick, I'm going to touch on a study conducted by former NFL offensive line coach Larry Zeidelin. He did a study, I think it was a six-year study, and he studied the efficiency of plays versus yards gained versus the amount of practice time spent on them. And he found this, that if you don't call a play more than 3.47 times per game, it's not worth practicing. And that's in a 60-minute, you know, four quarters of 15-minute NFL game. So think about, you know, a high school game is obviously much shorter. If you're not using a play more than three times a game, a particular play or a play call, it's probably not worth having or practicing. And obviously, the, obviously, these times below do not factor in the fakes that our offense really lives off of. So our number one play action is T28 and 29 boot. For us, we always numbered our play actions in the 20s because a one, you know, if a play was a one back, you know, like 17 or 18, that was a quarterback run. A 30 play, like 31 or 32, is a fullback run. Uh, a four play, so like 45 power, was a, a halfback run. So 28 and 29, 20s were our play actions. Um, our offensive line, we, we really stress to them to run block for three steps and then hold your ground with hands inside the breastplate and be a, a bad mother. Um, boot was our play action away from the power for us we kept the route simple you know our tight ends really only have to know three or four routes a drag route a corner route and a detroit wheel which we'll get into later and maybe a couple others but those three are really the ones they have to major in and a post route but those are just different breaking points um we liked running boot to the field which will count because it complemented our self-scout tendency of running to the boundary. As a play caller, we would do a self-scout every week, and we found that I had a tendency to call a lot of plays to the boundary, especially our boundary, my our sideline. For us, I think, and if you're going to run this play, I think it's important to perfect the, the fullback flat route. It's a really just a three-yard route. But for us in 2017 and 19, we averaged over 25 yards after catch. Um, the big coaching point is this is make sure you catch, secure the ball, and then get north and south and have rules for them if you're running it to the boundary. And if if a linebacker is, is going to come up or they're rotating the secondary down, our quarterbacks learned to identify, identify the flat defender pre-snap and for us, you know, our quarterbacks, we had some really smart kids, and it was easy for them to identify the flat defender on film. You know, like a 5-3, they knew pretty much it was a defensive end or the Sam or Will backer, depending on film study. Um, you have to drill into your offensive line's head that boot means opposite. Okay, so if it's 29 boot, the quarterback's really going to be rolling to his right, even though it's an, an odd number. Um, you know, some of the things I was studying, and this is down the road kind of things, but just to get you thinking as well as an audience, is false keys on protection schemes. If they do, if they're really hard at reading guards, or they're a pattern matching team that reads the tackle, um, and under center RPOs. I was talking to a coach in Northwest Ohio when we were before I decided to make the change from being a head coach to back to being a coordinator at another school. And we were talking about under center RPOs in the wing tee. Um, as you see there, those are our blocking rules. So to the, the backside tight end, the side that the quarterback is actually rolling to, ideally we want him to step with his inside foot first and rip 
run, sprint to eight yards, plan on the inside foot, and maybe get a, a little bit of a head jab, and then sprint on a 45 degree, degree angle to the corner. Um, our backside tackle's thought process is, I'm always gonna block the defender over me unless, using gap on away rules. The backside guard also has gap on away rules, but he's gotta listen for a down call. And actually we had a different code word, but um, listen for that code word by the center to block the inside gap. Our center's rules was gap, meaning the play side A gap, to on, and when in doubt, he would call down or use our code word, which meant everybody blocks down. Um, our, our play side guard now, the guy that's actually pulling opposite, so boot opposite, so he's pulling left here. If this, So this little diagram below is 28 boot. We call it a question mark pull. He's gonna pull, take one, two, three, and once he clears past the center, he's gonna cross over, gain a little bit of depth. He's gonna have his head on a swivel and try to get his shoulder square, looking at the end man on the line of scrimmage. If he hears a go call or a fire call from the quarterback, he's taking off running, looking inside out, picking up the first ugly jersey he sees. On the play side tackle, He's going to take a quick six inch lateral step inside at the snap. His rule is gap on away. 90% of the time, probably more than that, he is one on one in pass protection, taking away the shortest path to the quarterback. Again, we want to emphasize one block for three hard steps with your hands inside the breastplate and then hold your ground. Um, the play side tight end. So really it's the tight end away from the side the quarterback's rolling to. And sorry if this is confusing wording. He's gonna run a drag route at 10 to 12 yards. And this is critical guys, that you really coach them up on their route depths when you're running trap and throw or doing your pass skelly sessions, because they're gonna have a tendency to wanna run their drag route either right behind the linebackers or they're gonna run them at 15 to 20 yards because they see open grass. It's really critical you put a cone out there or a coach and really get them fixated on running that drag route at 10 to 12 yards because otherwise if they go too shallow or too deep, they're going to bring another defender into another player's zone. Uh, and if possible, settle in the window past the linebackers when they can. Never be more shallow than 10 yards. Just some other coaching points. So for our pulling guard, if that defensive end, the end man in line scrimmage comes up field, kick him out. If he sits or squeezes, you want to attack the outside shoulder and pin him in. And ideally, the quarterback can see that and run, just like the old Delaware wing tee waggle philosophy. You know, and we used to tell him at Anthony Wayne, he had a rule. If the defender's on your side of the grass, you kick his ass. And like I said, we went through the footwork really briefly for that pulling guard. Um, if you want it in more detail, you know, click pause right now and copy this down or email me or contact me on Twitter at the end after you watch this. And I'll gladly send you this presentation as well. So you have these coaching points. I probably break it down into more detail than needed, but that's just how I was taught it and coached. So this is what 28, T28 boot would look like against a 5-3. Boot means opposite, so 28 meaning we're faking power right. And coming back to the left. And now our fullback here, he has a rule. If he gets close to the sideline, he can wheel, he can turn and wheel up the sideline. Um, the film I'll show you here, our fullback had a tendency to wheel up sooner than he could. And we also had a tag sometimes, we would actually tag it with a code word, where he would start to wheel up sooner than later because the lineback, those stacked linebackers would stay in the box and try to run down the quarterback and just get us north and south quicker. So that's what boot would look like against a 5-3. The next common alignment, defensive alignment we would see is a 6-2. And again, this could possibly, if they're all pinching down, 
This could be a situation where our, our center makes a code word call. Um, you could use like wall, wall. Everybody's blocking down, making a wall. Or domino, everybody's blocking down. Dominoes all fall down. Whatever your code word wants to be. And again, like the left tight end here, he, he is ripping inside. He's gonna take a lateral at the snap. Six inch lateral step inside, rip with his left. He's sprinting to eight yards, planting on that right foot with a little head jab, then breaking on a 45 degree angle to, towards the pylon. Um, the right halfback, he's on a J block course, just like power. And then he's gonna either dip inside or outside, wherever's the easiest possible release. Inside that end man line scrimmage, all the way to eight yards. And then he's breaking on a skinny post, <coughs> ideally behind the free safety. We never throw, we very rarely do we ever throw that backside post unless it was tagged. We would just call it T20, T28 boot post. And our quarterback would know to look at the post first. Um, it was, that was usually his fourth read. The right tight end is running that drag at 10 to 12 yards. And the, and the fullback's route, he's taking one step normal, like on his midline path, then he's breaking outside. He's got to break outside and beat the pulling guard out there. His route, he is never deeper than three yards. It's very important that he doesn't drift deeper because he can drift into that drag route if he's not careful. Um, another key coaching point here is the left halfback. Once he gets the power fake, he is picking up anything offside, uh, outside, I'm sorry, outside of the right tackle's outside hip. He's got to become an extra blocker in the, in the protection. So use the layered handoff for the fake and hopefully sprint towards that edge and get tackled. But if not, he's got to become an extra blocker here. Against a 7-2. The down call is made by the center because, because of both guards being covered. This is against like a double bear look, we call it, or a 7-2. Um, because there's two extra guys outside the tackle there, the pulling guard should expect a kick out. And the quarterback's got to know too, and this is something we would talk about in film study, is that, you know, based on the fact that there's two guys going to be unblocked outside the tackle. He's probably not going to be able to break the contain. He's probably going to have to set up in the pack in the pocket. But we know in this situation as well, and really anytime the more in running this offense, we what we have learned is the more guys the defense puts on the line of scrimmage, the better, because trap is going to hit eventually, and our play action is going to hit. So in this situation. Quarterback's probably going to be looking for the flat route to the drag route. So here's some film. So this is 28 boot, meaning it's going to be coming back to the left here. Oh, my apologies there. I would like to see the fullback flatten his router a little quicker. And I would like to see the halfback be a more aggressive blocker. Actually, I'll just let this, let this roll through. The fullback should have wheeled up there but the corner route was open. So was the post there. Our, we got lucky here. Luckily, number 33, our fullback is a, a good athlete and made the catch. He's actually gonna go on to play slot receiver at the University of Finley next year. And this looks like from the 2018 season. 
So, so right there in that situation, I apologize again, fellas. The fullback should have kept his route a little more flat here. But it ends up working out. So that's boot. That's our number one play action play. Boot wheel. Like I said, remember everything remains the same up front. The only difference is now the backside halfback will be faking power and blocking the blind side edge for the quarterback. Then he'll release on a wheel route. So actually this is a typo. It should say, it should say boot throwback, not boot wheel. So this is boot throwback. The quarterback, he needs to be aware that he's not going to have extra help on that back side that he's rolling away from. So after the fake, it's going to be a quick one, two, three. He's going to set his feet, flip his hips, and turn back and look through for the wheel route up the sideline. He's got to know, don't force it. If necessary, throw it away, and we'll live to play another down. Um, that backside halfback that's faking power, then releasing. He, he should throttle down, you know, give the illusion of blocking quickly, like a 1,001 and go, but then release upfield. And he can't stop running. He's got, this is something he's got to catch on the run. It can't be adjust and stop. Um, make sure you assign a coach in the box to watch the secondary's reaction to boot and the defensive end's reaction because that will determine when you should call this. If they're starting to get aggressive and rotate their secondary or as soon as they know it's play action, their free safety screaming hard down and the, the opposite corner is bailing, that's when you want to start calling this. Um, like I said earlier, the more guys the defense has on the line of scrimmage, the better chance of boot throwback hitting for six, which means all your offensive line should be blocking down as well. Uh, so your quarterback's not going to have a whole lot of time. So it's set, flip, and just let it rip. And this is boot throwback. Again, I apologize for the typos here. But we have nothing to hide as far as terminology. This is 28 boot throwback. This would be against a 5-3. And we would call this, you know, when I was the head coach and a play caller, we called this once a game. Unless we were playing a well coach, I knew it was a well coached defense, or they were a team that had seen the T in back to back weeks, then I might not have. But I think this is a better play on second and five, second and four, um, than it is on third and long. Um, I like this play much more actually in the double if you get into a double wing set and run jet motion I like it much more off of that I think it's a much harder to defend boot lead wheel so for us when we said we would say lead was our version of power but with the fullback leading through as well instead of carrying out a trap fake um but now we are actually going to have the fullback go on the wheel route here the play side, the nearer halfback is going to continue to run his halfback, his, po his skinny post. And the backside halfback is going to block just like normal boot. But now the fullback's going to release on a wheel route. So this is really the safest bet. If you want to run boot throwback, but still have the same amount of protection, this is the best answer. And it's really a hard play to defend because. You have the ideal amount of protection, and you're still releasing an extra guy. If they're silly enough to play man, I mean, in most in most five three defenses, the Mike linebacker will be assigned to the fullback. So that's something else to look at. Um, something else I I've explored in the past, and I've run in the past, but I don't have film of it today. Was running a halfback screen off of this as well. It's really nothing more than the, the old Delaware wing tee waggle screen or waggle throwback. So our next play action pass is 17-18 keep pass and, and power pass or 
what some guys call keep pass switch. Again, run block the offensive line, you're run blocking for three hard steps. And I really think it's important when you're preseason installing this, if you can get your offensive line in a room and show them film, draw it up, but really get them to understand the concept of the play. What are we selling here, guys? On boot, we're selling play action away from power. Well, on keep pass, we're selling play action to power. And this is really kind of the an old school, our version of an RPO. The quarterback has the option to pull it and run, but even though there is guys going on on routes. This is a two-man combination. The other thing is this, and I learned this the hard way as my first year as a head coach. I thought, well, why don't we release the backside 10 end? Well, I found that if you release the backside tight end, it can give a defensive end time to run this down because of its, its fakes, it's a little bit more slower developing. So make sure your backside tackle and backside tight end tailgate block, which is a hard six inch step inside, lateral step inside, they're protecting their inside gap to outside. So it's gap, meaning inside gap, on, away. The fullback, it needs to have a great fake and then bend his path in the backside A gap to help with protection. Now, the backside halfback, who would be selling power here? He's going to sell power. He's going to use the layered handoff uh, technique. He's going to ride the fake with the quarterback, 1001. And then he's going to explode into the play side A gap, hopefully get tackled. But at the very least, he's going to help with protection. Um, again, make sure your quarterback identifies who the flat defender is and whether they're one high or two high. Um, again, I apologize if the wording when it comes to play side and back side is confusing to you, but it's a little more clear on keep pass. So say this was 18 keep pass going to the right. The back side tight end, which would be the left tight end, is going to tailgate block. And remember, it's important that nothing crosses his face inside. Um, same rule for the backside tackle. The backside guard now, he's going to use the same exact technique that he does on boot. He's going to pull flat, one, two, three, past the center, cross over and gain depth with his eyes on the end man in the line scrimmage. If he hears a go call or a fire call, He's attacking that defensive end or the outside, or I mean the end man in the line of scrimmage, whoever that may be. And hopefully attack the outside shoulder so the quarterback can carry out a uh, keep course. Center's rule is on away, but when in doubt, he can make a down call or whatever code word you want to use and block every gap down. Uh, the play side guard and play side tackle have a gap on rule, meaning inside gap first, then on. Um, the play side tackle needs to understand, though, in almost all situations, he's going to be blocking the man over him, even if that defender is a little bit of an outside shade, like a five technique. A five technique. The play side tight end is going to run what we call a Detroit wheel route. So he, this is very important here. He's going to step with the inside foot first. He's going to sell a down block. He's going to throw his right. So if we were running 18 keep pass, which is to the right, he's going to throw his right shoulder into the tackle like he's down blocking. 1,001, and then he's going to pivot on his outside foot, open to the sideline, and sprint, releasing no deeper than three yards. Um, I wish I had a whiteboard feature so I could kind of draw the route for you, but hopefully the film does it justice. Um, the play side halfback, he's going to be on a J block path, which is a kick out path for us. Then he's going to release on a wheel route. Um, we've also at times made game plan adjustments um, and had him run a comeback route, which would be meaning stop at 17 yards and come back to 15 or run a deep out at 10 yards or 12 yards or 15 and over. These are just little adjustments we've made over the, well, eight or nine years I've been running this offense out of, in one way, shape, or form.
So right there is 17 keep pass, selling power on the play side, the back side, the right tackle and right tight end here. That's your tailgate block. Nothing's crossing their face inside. The quarterback is selling 17 keep or 45 power. Power left or quarterback keep left, whatever you want to call it. Like I said, so in this situation, the left tight end here, he would be taking a right down step using his left shoulder to throw a hard forearm into the hip pad of that defensive tackle and push. Then turning and pivoting and opening the sprinting to the sideline no deeper than three yards. Our left halfback here, and we like this best, is when it's not a, a true wheel route, but more of a wheel into a corner route. So he's on that J block course. Ideally, the defensive end is stepping down and squeezing because of the tight ends inside release. So as our left halfback is on a J block course, once he gets to eight yards, plant hard on that right side, that right foot or his inside foot, hard head jab to the inside, 45 degree angle towards the pylon. Keep pass switch. All that means is that the tight end and the play side halfback are just switching routes. And a lot of people, this is like the old eye formation power pass. Tight end's gonna run really a corner route. Again, though, we want him stepping hard with his inside foot first, ripping through with his outside arm to eight yards. If he's a little bit faster tight end, have him go to 10 yards, then break the route on a 45 degree angle, the near halfback is releasing on that flat route, no deeper than three yards, and everything else remains the same. And here's just some film, I'll let it run through this first time. 17 key pass. The quarterback should have read it, wrote it, the fake a little bit more. That backside halfback does a poor job faking here. But it's tough on the goal line. And really, the t there's a lot of traffic to get through. I would have liked to see that tight end be a little more physical, but obviously it gives you guys a visual of what it should look like. Now I want you to, again, I'm gonna roll this back one more time here. I want you to watch the right tackle. The right tackle here should have been stepping with his left foot, keeping his shoulder square, and his rule is gap on away. Nothing should have been crossing his face inside. But this kid at the time was a soft, a 15 year old sophomore with a big body, he's still learning. Great kid, he'll have a great career, but just, didn't quite get it yet. And I don't like the guys on the backside just watching the play. Our backs, our right tight end here should have stayed with the block. But regardless, all whining and coaching points aside, we got the job done. Michigan pass. Um, when you play a team that's going to play with two high safeties, this is a must have in your offense. It's more of a drop back play action than a, a rollout play action like boot or keep passes. It can be run from the wing T in a double tight look. It can be run from the T. It can be run from an eye formation look if you have like an eye wing look. Um, like I said, it's great against two high safeties. Both tight ends here are going to run corner routes. They're both going to plant on their inside foot at eight yards. If you have a really fast there, kid there, they can probably break that route at 10 yards and still plant on their inside foot. But the key point here is don't stop running. Okay, pull the defenders out of the zones. The play side halfback. So like 
in the past, we only ran Michigan pass one way. We had always run it to our right. Um, the play side halfback would go on a J block course and then plant on his outside foot. And he runs almost like a modified skinny post. And we just said, you're really running towards center field. If the safety runs with you, if, if a safety runs with you, keep running because that means one of the tight ends is open. Um, usually though, the play side halfback is the open receiver on this route. Um, it's important that your quarterback is, is looking, you know, post snap is looking at one of the safeties that running with a tight end. Otherwise, if he just looks at center field, looks at, or the deep third, and is looking at the halfback, it's gonna bring a safety or defender into that window. Um, there's different ways of blocking it. Um, you can pull a false pull a guard and have a fullback fill for him. For us, we kept it simple though. And you'll, I'll show you the diagram, but we had all of our offensive linemen just step inside and protect their inside gap. The fullback faked a trap course for two steps, then goes and picks up, picks up any defender showing off the outside hip of the backside tackle and backside C to D gap, while the backside halfback would fake power and then pick up anything off what we would call, quote, the play side C to D gap or the outside of the play side tackles hip. Um, it probably makes more sense if I show you the visual than me talking you through these words. But after the power fake, so it's remember the quarterback has to get his back to the defense for a second gives back to the defense and hunch, kind of like that old, the old NFL, NFL style play action. Half ride that fake and then turn around, glance, get his hips set and feet set and make his decision. So hopefully this diagram makes a little more sense now with the blocking rules. The offense, the guards and tackles are stepping inside. Again, run blocking for three yard steps, nothing crosses your face inside. Be aggressive. If we're playing a, a team that really has a you know a real ass kicker at defensive tackle or nose guard, we'll give permission for that kid to get cut legally. Um, again, our tight ends are ripping with their inside foot stepping with their inside foot first, ripping with their outside arm to get vertical. Um, and then breaking towards the pylon. Against the 50, this was probably the most common look we saw. Um, these guys were the contained players. These guys were flat players, deep half, deep half, flat, and then the inside backers read guards. Other teams that run this sometimes will pull a guard and have a fullback fill to draw one of these guys out, but we just wanted to keep it simple. Here, so here's Michigan pass. This is out of a double tight wing left look. We just call this left, form left formation. Again, we'll, we'll go through this one more time. Halfbacks are picking up any C to D gap defenders, offensive line are stepping inside. Quarterback has plenty of time. And there you go. That's called Michigan Pass. So Texas Pass. Texas Pass evolved over the years for us. Um, it was our answer. It was basically like, okay, well, we can run Michigan Pass against two high safeties, but what do we do against just a single safety? So it started off as a crossing combo, and then it evolved to a little bit different crossing combination in my last season as a head coach, but this was Texas Pass. Um, our tight ends had one new route to learn, and it was our version of a dig route at 14 yards. The play side halfback, instead of running the, so just kind of like keep pass where he would run 
uh, a J block course and plant and run a corner out at eight yard, break that corner out at eight to 10 yards. Now he's going to run a true wheel route. He's not going to break on a, a 45 degree angle. Again, just like Michigan Pass, there's different ways of protecting it. For us, we want to keep protections the same as similar as possible. Um, it's the same exact protection as Michigan Pass. <clears throat> Even though, although in I believe it was 2016 and 15, we would sprint out protected this as more of a uh, sprint out protection, but. In 2019, my final season as the head coach, we just kept it simple and used the same protection. Um, after the power fake, you know, the, the quarterback still has to hunch, half ride the fake, turn around, glance at his hips, and make his decision. It's very similar to the belly keep pass as well. That's what it evolved to for us anyway. So as you see here, so if we're calling, and this is how we called it. We just call it T Texas pass right. The left tight end will run his drag, just like if it was 29 boot. The right tight end will run a 14 yard dig. We wanted him to run that dig though at one yard in front of the free safety. So that sometimes will get adjusted, but we wanted to try to use him as a decoy for the free safety. The right halfback, we run a J block course into a wheel. So in an ideal world though, these three half these three backs are our best players. The goal was for the dig route to hopefully draw in the corner or at least the free safety. This drag route would hopefully draw in the corner and would leave our right half back unoccupied up the sideline. And we just had to get it protected from then on out. I mean, it's a seven man protection. Again, the fullback's picking up anything outside of the tackle. The left half back in this situation is picking up anything outside of the right tackle. So this is Texas pass right. This is against airport. It was a well coached team in our area. This was 2017, so we blocked it a little bit different back then. My apologies. No, we didn't. We blocked it just like I had diagrammed up, but still, that's what it looked like. That was Texas Pass, which eventually evolved into Crossers Pass, which it almost looked like Belly Keep Pass for you, Del for the guys that know the Delaware Wing T except we'd have one tight end drag across and another tight end run a deeper drag that almost drifted into a kind of like a shallow post, I guess. I'll just let it run through. I do not like our quarterback steps here. They're not very crisp. It should be turned. One, two, three, stop. You should not have to get eight yards deep here, but all points aside, tight end runs the correct route. The only thing I will say is I would like to see number six, Ty here, keep running, but I get it. He was trying to adjust to the ball. But if he would keep running, he already has these guys outran. And Matt, our quarterback at the time, could have just let the ball rip. But regardless, we score. And that's what it all comes down to, right? I'll show that one more time. Sorry about that. Break. So the drag. The tight end's aiming for his normal 10 to 12 yards. Ty, the right tight end here, is basically running almost a, a post. He's breaking at about 10 yards. 
the right halfback is releasing on a flat route, which you could also keep them in for protection, but for us, it just kind of gave us an outlet. If they ended up being in too high safety, it gave us an outlet. And number six is just a really good athlete. He'll hopefully end up playing college baseball or college football somewhere in, after this upcoming season. Blood pass is some we've run every year. But in the one knock against it, though, is in the T, you have to run it with a motion. Otherwise, you have to get into some kind of strong formation. Um, we, do, we did like it, though, because it can be run from multiple formations, and the rules stay the same. Um, it's a seven-man protection with a quarterback sprint out. Um, ideally, your quarterback's attacking the edge. Um, the kid we had the last two years, the main the starter anyway, was just he was not a true sprint out quarterback or runner. We we did the best we could with him, which is I guess all that matters. Um, big thing is this though. The fullback has to be aggressive and tacking the edge. He cannot take three to four steps and catch. He has to be going downhill like it's a straight line J block. Um, if I could go back in time and change it, I wish that we would have been a lot better as far as the block on this. Um, also, mo the motion we used to run this play, we also ran trap, belly, and counter off of it. So we had a little mini series built into it. One new route was we had, it was almost a nine, 10 yard route, 10 yard out, um, deeper, obviously, depending on the kind of athlete. Um, the downside though to this is it's a new protection scheme. Um, it's, it takes practice time to get better at. So, and really the only time we worked on it was during trap and throw. I'm sorry, not trap and throw, but we had a team pass session we would do on Tuesdays for eight minutes. And then during team sessions, which, okay, if you, you know, we might run two reps of it. So we just didn't, in the grand scheme of things, we didn't have a lot of time to perfect the sprint out protection. Um, and we're not the kind of program and we will never be, you know, wherever I'm at, the kind of program that is doing full 11 man drills in January. That's just not the kind of program I want to be a part of. So I'm um, also, <clears throat> If you don't do a ton of sprint out, which in 2019, this was only the only true sprint out play we had. Um, the footwork is relatively all new and it doesn't really tie into anything. It better fits if you run a jet series out of a double wing, you know, red, blue, or double wing, double tight, double wing look. Um, the big couple coaching points to remember is on sprint protection, and I could, you know, sprint out protection is a whole nother clinic in itself, but. The backside guard, if he's covered, he stays with the slide, meaning protecting his inside gap. If he's uncovered, he begins the hinge. He'll step hard inside, look inside, check A, inside A, and then turn back. And then the rest of the backside offensive line, so the backside tackle and tight end, six inch lateral step inside, and the rules is gap, inside gap, on away, or tailgate. So that's what flood right looks like. Our quarterback, he would raise his heel to begin the motion. And as the left halfback is coming up the line of scrimmage and sprinting past him, he'll tap him on the hip. And as soon as the quarterback feels that tap, he begins our cadence, which was ready, set, go. Um, the quarterback opens to the play side, gains depth with shoulders downfield, reading low high. Our right head end runs the corner route, just like he's run before on boot. Nothing new there. And then the left halfback, like I said, he runs the motion out. The mo he runs motion, taps the, the hip of the quarterback. He's got to remember he can't be into the, going into the line of scrimmage at the snap. He's got to keep his shoulder square to the line of scrimmage. And then he's going to run a nine-yard speed out, which sometimes turn into 10 yards or eight yards, depending on the flow of the play. but ideally about nine yards or so. There's some film of flood. So what's here? This is against Ida, our rival. 
who we had not beaten in my first four years at Fundy and finally got him this past year. Very well coached. Jeff Potter does a great job with him and his staff. Sprint out protection. And our, our right tenant does a great job here. Um, notice though, our fullback should be attacking the edge here. He's very hesitant. He's got to go. He shouldn't be sitting here and waiting. We ran to the boundary because they're more of a field defense. Our left guard should have took a bet. I'll run this play one more time. Our left guard should have took a harder step inside with his right foot and hinged. Hard step inside and hinge. One more time, we'll take a look at the right guard here. The right guard should be lateral stepping. And he just kind of watches there. He's a spectator. That kid was a sophomore at the time, though. He'll only get better. That's 81 and 82 flood. So our Tiger package. Um, we will not use the Tiger package at SMCC. We did not use the Tiger package at my last season at Dundee, but we did use it in 2018. We created this out of necessity. Um, our quarterback at the time was a great kid, a very smart, intelligent kid. Um, but he was not the best running quarterback. Uh, so we wanted to create a formation where if we were down in a hole, we could still um, get, them all, get the ball up and down the field. So we, Tiger Package, it's a double, and the, the formation is exactly what you see, see here in this picture. This is Tiger right. It's double tight, quads right. Um, we had a numbering system, there was a man protection where, so the center would t always block zero, the guards would take number one in the count, tackles would take number two in the count. Um, but yeah, we would do both quick game, so catch and throw really for the quarterback and sprint out. Personally, I think that this formation, looking at it from a defensive point of view, is very tough to defend. If we were a spread team, and it's what we did, I mean, we would probably do a lot, we would probably gotten a lot more out of this formation. I mean, we spent, I believe, two periods a week on this and then sprinkled it into our team offense session, but I mean, as you see here, I mean, right now it's three on, if you count this eligible receiver, one, two, four on three, or three on two, whatever way you want to look at it. And we always, the key here is this though, is we always shifted to this formation from the T. So we would line up under center in the T, the quarterback would yell shift, and our backfield would literally sprint out here while our quarterback backed up. So our defense, the defense can never change personnel. Um, personally, I think if you have a running quarterback, that this formation would be even harder to defend. We never ran the football out of this formation. I think we ran one trap, quarterback trap out of it, and that was it. Um, but yet teams still struggled to align to it. Um, you know, it's a tough formation to defend because of the fact your defense Technically, you have eight gaps to defend, along with four receivers to one side. And we'd always put our best tight end, best receiver away from the quads. Um, like I said, it was mostly sprint out protection and concepts to the quad side, although we did have a tight end screen away from it. Um, we also did what we called tiger right slide, where and actually, we had a different code word for it. We called it circus, which because it looked like a, a damn circus, but the form, so we would shift to tiger right and then shift again. Where so the three receivers would go to the other side, and then our entire offensive line, including the tight ends and the center, would shift down a person. So our right guard would become the new center. 
Now, granted, our right guard was actually our backup center, so it works out. But I'll try. I think we have film film of it on here, though. Um, the downside to all this is, is I really think you need the quarterback who can run to attack those gaps, whether it be trap, dive, or inside zone, counter GT. You can really use your imagination. I'm not a spread guy, but I I tried to look at it from a defensive point of view that this formation's tough to defend. It's going to be tough to adjust to on the fly if you're shifting to it. Um, the only time we, we did not just shift to it was in a two-minute situation, and that's when we went off wristbands and we just say, you know, wristband 31, and the entire formation plus play call was on there. Um, you know, a little bit of humor here. Um, after this quarantine, they might need a new name now to the – new Netflix series. If I tried to install Tiger Package somewhere, the kids might laugh and think I'm Joe Exotic or something, but regardless. So one of our favorite concepts out of Tiger Package was Snag. Um, you know, we took it right out of the Noel Mazzoni playbook. Um, this right number one receiver has to have patience running the Snag route. Number two would run the corner. Number three would run a bubble. And even though I have 82 protection drawn up here, this is probably, inc this is incorrect. We would have ran our man protection here, which was 61. Um, and it'd be a th really a th the equivalent of a three-step under center passing game. 82 Portland was post wheel out. So we had a, a post by number one where he'd break at eight yards inside. The fullback would run the wheel, and our fullback and our offense was always our best athlete usually. So we got a ton of mileage out of this route right here. And then we had a 10-yard, or actually, I'm sorry, a 5-yard out right here. 82 means sprint out to the right. So Tiger right Wolverine. Um, we actually got this play watching film of Michigan. And so it's a crossing concept. It's best against man coverage, or if you see two high man under, one high man under. Um, and remember, the left tight end was always our best player, our best receiver, I should say, not our best player. But so we had a shallow crossing route right here at the heel behind the, the heels, the original heels of the defensive line. The fullback would run a drag at 10 yards. The right halfback would run the post, and then our left tight end would run a drag, and we had to practice this on cones a lot. We would run a crossing drag at 12 yards. So the quarterback, he would take two steps, one, two, and then kind of, I'm sorry, he would catch, one, two, and then turn back, and it, he would always hit this kid coming across the field. So here's some film of our Tiger package. There's Portland. So right here was the circus, the shift we talked about. Well, hold on, we'll come back to it. So here's 82 Portland again, post wheel out. So this was circus. These three receivers were originally lined over here. We so they we said shift, they lined up over here, and then we did another shift and they came back over here. Notice our offensive line all shifted down a man as well. Our right guard is now the new center. And they're in a tight alignment. And it was just post wheel out again and hit it for a first down. There's snag. We'll run through this one more time. If you guys want more information on this, I actually have a whole PowerPoint or Google Slides presentation with all of our 
tiger uh, formations and concepts out of it. It was obviously not a big part of what we did. It was a package out of necessity. Um, but to be honest, we got a lot of mileage out of it. Um, and did a lot of good for us. And as you see here, it's it's not the easiest formation to align to when you're defending eight gaps plus four receivers to one side. If you're a spread guy, I'm sure you can get really creative with this. It's just not what I do, it's not what I'm about, but it served its purpose for us. So some other resources for you, whether you're wing T or otherwise, um, as far as the passing game, anything by Dennis Crehan is good. He has a great quarterback and quarterback syllabus and play calling manual. He also has a two book series called Installing the Wing T Volume One and Two. Um, there's a book called by Tubby Raymond, you know, the legendary coach from the University of Delaware called the Delaware Wing T Order of Football. Sadly, it's out there right now on the internet on PDF for free, but it's a, you know, a good book to own as well. Tom Herman, who's an assistant coach at Mercyhurst College, has a Wing T manual and on his website, he has a ton of clinic DVDs. Um, I know DVDs are kind of on their way out in this world, but I highly suggest you pick them up they're worth it. The coaching points, the camp practices, all that stuff. If you're a wing T guy, a T guy, and you really want to know all the ins and outs of this offense, I highly suggest you pick it up. I also found an old book in a used bookstore in Detroit called The Unbalanced Open End T Offense by Eddie T. Um, I found this book randomly at King's Bookstore in downtown Detroit. And I figured, hey, why not? And I looked through it and actually got a lot of good ideas from it. Passing game and run game from unbalanced T, from end over, from end split out. It was some good stuff. Um, the Coaching the Wing T by the Experts book has some good little art, mini articles in it. And also, I, I picked up some ideas from Dennis Crehan has a, I believe it's a two DVD set. It's called Coaching the Pro Wing T, where he has a flanker and then a split end as well great passing game resources that really shaped our passing game over the years. Um, Al Black, coaching the run and shoot football. I was at Anthony Wayne. Um, we used a lot of his materials and kind of made a modified sprint out passing game based off his old run and shoot stuff. Anything by Andrew Coverdale and Dan Robinson, the, his quick passing game stuff, coaching the quarterback, his PowerPoints, his DVDs, I suggest picking it up. Um, we do not, I've never personally ran it, but I've read all the material and, and studied some of the material. The Darren Slack R4 system, um, it can be applied to other offenses other than the spread, but it, it's a little time consuming to learn, I think. But if you're a guy that believes in the passing game, I think that Darren Slack and his materials, there's no way to go, you know, it's a very good, sound, safe way to go. Um, Steve Axman, he's not a very popular coach as far as, you know, nation known, you know, being on ESPN, but he's wrote a lot of great books and, and put out some good DVDs as well. Um, he has a book called Attacking Coverages with the Passing Game. And he actually has another book called Coaching Situational Football. Both of those are really good. Um, there's another a uh, DVD called The Texas Slot T by Brian Herman. It was uh, put out by Championship Productions, I recommend. And then there's a quarterback book, one of the best quarterback books I've ever re uh, read by Terry Shea called Eyes Up. It's only available on his website, so you have to Google his website, but it's definitely worth, I believe it's like $30, and it's a hard copy book, but 
it's very well written. And even, you know, I'm, I've always been an offensive line coach, defensive line coach. And even for this guy, I found it, you know, easy to understand and apply to help quarterbacks. Uh, just some th uh, closing thoughts. Just remember this, whether you're a head coach you know, or a, an assistant coach or a coordinator, at the end of the day, there's only so many plays in a game. So be weary, weary of how much you really add. Remember, don't water down the Kool-Aid. If you're going to add something to your offense, you better be willing to take something else out because there's only so many time, there's only so much time in a day, and there's only so many plays in a game. Uh, for us, in my personal opinion, this is just my personal philosophy. Summer is the time to work the passing game because once we get into the regular season. We'll have trap and throw and maybe a team pass session once or twice per week, and that's it. Um, when you run the tee, you obviously have to work on running the football a lot more. And remember, in the power tee, our, block, our adjustments in the, during games are, are blocking adjustments. They're not new plays. They're not cute formations. So we get good at what we do. Um, if, you, if I, you know, looking back on it, if I had a special quarterback or wide receiver type, I'm going to find a way to feature them. But otherwise, I think there's enough variations of waggle or what I call boot and other ways you can get creative-wise um, formations or motion-wise to throw the ball. You know, the older I get, the more I probably will do less formations out of the tee and maybe some more different motions, but there's enough variations out there. Um, at a small school, I'll, prob I'll probably never again will I do the shotgun and under center. Like I said, it comes down to time and reps. And shotgun snaps, protection, quarterback fo footwork, um, you know, devoting time to those things. It took, a, I believe, looking back on it in hindsight, it took away from us perfecting our under center stuff. It took away time from us getting better on special teams, getting better on defense. Um, and we had some really good uh, special teams. We had some really good defenses at Dundee. I mean, one year we averaged allowing only 16 points per game. So, but it took, I just think we could have been so much better, but you know, as a younger head coach, younger, I'm getting old now. Uh, I wanted to have all these answers, and the older I get, the real the more I realize less is more. Um, and also, don't be afraid to use seven on seven to install your passing game. For at Dundee, I would only do three dates a year for seven on seven, and we would do four team round robins. All those co programs teams that we uh, did seven on sevens with, I always tried to do them with teams and coaches that we had a good relationship with because I wanted to teach during those times. I, I wanted to coach our kids. I don't care about winning seven on seven championships. It don't mean anything to me. For us, it was a time to get better at what we do. So, um, and I didn't want us to get into bad habits on defense. So for us, it, seven on sevens are more of a coaching thing than a competition thing. Um, you know, especially with this quarantine and now that it's been lifted, at least in Michigan and hopefully for wherever you're at, there's a lot of great technology out there to help you help your skilled positions learn the passing game without live reps and uh, take advantage of them. Um, I know Go Army Edge, I believe, is the program. They have a great platform. I'm, I'm trying to learn more about. I know there's other interactive programs out there, and obviously there's Huddle Playbook and, and making playlists on Huddle, which is what we do. But uh, there's a lot of technology out there, and I think one of the bright sides of this quarantine is, is there's going to be a lot of coaches who realize that there's different ways to do things. Um, before I finish, I've, I've done this, I've read this one other in one other presentation. And um, I got a lot of compliments on it, so I wanted to make sure I shared it during this as well. And this is called Unwritten Rules of the Coaching Profession. It was originally written by Ben Albert, who's an assistant coach at Duke University. Um, number one, don't allow yourself to get so caught up in taking care of others 
that you forget to take care of your family and yourself. Number two, know the importance of putting aside individual differences for the sake of the kids in the program. Um, let's face it, fellas, if you coach with guys with big egos, you're probably not gonna be successful in the long run. Uh, never forget about the people who helped you get to where you are today. And you went off of that, help someone else climb the ladder. I know we all want to be successful. I know there's a lot of guys out there who have aspirations of coaching at the college level or going from assistant coach to a coordinator or being assistant coach to a head coach. Just help others climb the ladder, okay? Um, don't sacrifice your integrity for the sake of pleasing others. You know, just make sure you stay true to what you believe in. Give back to the profession. Uh, this can be as easy as joining your state coaches association, joining the American Football Coaches Association. There's a lot of great opportunities out there by joining those organizations, not to mention just the networking and learning opportunities for learning out there. Um, if you're going to leave for another opportunity, do it the right way. You know, make sure that you leave the place better than you found it. And, uh, whether you left on bad terms or not, whether you have hard feelings towards your old position or not, it's better to just take the high road and walk away with the class and dignity. Um, loyalty is invaluable. You know, even, you know, I try, I consider myself loyal to a fault almost. It's probably a bad thing at sometimes, but loyalty is invaluable. Even, you know, you never, it's always going to be tested. Even if you're an assistant coach, a coordinator, small school, big school, college, high school, just make sure you stay loyal, okay? Coaching can be a lonely gig sometimes. Leave your ego at home. Remember, what you got to figure out what's your why. Why are you in coaching? If it's for anything other than, you know, making a positive impact on young people, uh, I'm not so sure if this profession's the, the place for you in the long run because. There ain't a whole lot of money in it, and the state championships, the prestige and all that, it, it fades away real fast. And last but not least, never stop learning. Um, you can always, there's always room for learning somewhere, somehow. Um, fellas, coaches, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to watch this presentation. Um, I hope you got something out of it. If there's any way I can help you, your staff, or your program, feel free to contact me. There's my cell phone. It's better to contact me via text message or email um, or add me on Twitter, follow me or whatever, however that works. Send me a message and I'll get back to you. Those are the best ways to get a hold of me. Um, I love helping others, helping other coaches learn the game, especially when it comes to T football. Um, I was, I've been really fortunate throughout my career to coach and learn from some really good coaches, uh, play for a really good coach in Jack Jarmo. And so if there's anything I can do for you and your staff, feel free to reach out to me. Um, I hope everyone gets back to work soon on the field and that you all stay safe and that we're all playing football and we're all grateful to play in 2020. Take care and God bless.